cabinet brought against the multimedia group after the airing of that documentary, Militia at the Heart of the Nation. Government wanted the NMC to ask the multimedia group to retract and apologize, to retract the documentary and apologize for airing it, and also to prescribe sanctions against the group. But this is what the NMC found, read to you by Fifi Kunti. The complaint was that the documentary had made certain claims which could not be supported by the fact adduced. And in line with the law, there was the need for the NMC to investigate the matter and direct a retraction and an apology for doing this particular uh, documentary. But the NMC says it is unfortunate that before the complaint was submitted, the government went public on the matter. As part of the settlement process, the commission finds the uh, commentary on the documentary and the association with the Ayawaso West Wogan violence as misleading and a misrepresentation. However, because the multimedia group published a rejoinder from the government, we direct that it publishes our ruling. And it concluded by saying that the commission commends both uh, parties and their counsel for their cooperation and diligent manner in which they pursue the matter before the commission. If you come to taking us through some salient points of the NMC's ruling, here is managing news editor of the multimedia group, Elvis, well, of Joy News in the multimedia group, Elvis Kwashi. We respect the commission, we accept the decision, but we disagree. There's something in the ruling that said we link the president to the operations of the, the DI group. We didn't. All we did was to say the leader of the group had worked with the president when he was in president. That's the only extent to which the president came to this conversation. Was the work a misrepresentation? No. Kojo Opon Kroma is information minister. He also responded to the NMC's ruling. Right from the beginning, we have mentioned that we hold multimedia in high esteem. I think we've been very clear with that. We took issue with a particular piece of work that was put out and we sought to use the legal avenues to um, seek to advance um, our case. Um, I think we are pleased that the key issues that we raised were found uh, to be true by the Commission. We also take notice and agree with the view of the Commission that the attempt to uncover whatever was going on at the castle was in the national or the public interest, no doubt about it. And the view also that having published a rejoinder, an apology may not be necessary. Just what may be necessary will be a full publication of their findings as set out. And that's, I think, you have read um, already. Uh, I think that in this enterprise of public engagement, um, we all don't get it right every time. And in an instance uh, like this, without resorting to extreme measures, we can find ways by which we can uh, get the record settled and uh, build on from them. We hold this organization in high esteem, and I think that in itself has even been missing in all of this conversation. Um, it is this particular piece of work that we disagree with it. We welcome this ruling, and um, we hope that, uh, for example, some of the regulations that the uh, NMC refers to, and uh, what I would consider as a silent caution, that we should do well as journalists at all times to avoid things that uh, uh, will appear to be misrepresentations or uh, misleading narratives. And as much as possible, stick with um, maybe generally acceptable expressions of the facts as we uncover them are things that we can all learn a lesson from and uphold. Kojo Opon Kruma, the Information Minister, uh, speaking to us in response to the NMC ruling. Now, we also spoke with the head of the Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abraima. Listen. Let me start by saying that the decision by government to go to the NMC um, was a right decision. If you, are, if you are not satisfied with something, it's one of the avenues that you can try to ventilate your concerns. Um, and in the process, reading the decision by the NMC, it is quite clear that both parties, you know, um, made themselves available and did cooperate with the whatever investigations or um, processes that the NMC undertook. And I think that that is also quite commendable. However, um, as regards the decision from the commission, first of all, I think this was a classical case that provided an opportunity for the Commission to help all of us, 
particularly journalists in terms of how they go about doing investigations, particularly on matters of public interest and on matters that um, usually cannot be uncovered by routine methods. Now, the other point that I have is that um, even though the commission set out for itself three key areas for determination, in the end, uh, I don't think that it made conclusions that helped us understand whether on those three issues the journalist was wrong or right. Now, first of it is this idea of what, what is a vigilante group or a militia group. I think the, judge, the decision from the commission alludes to it, but it doesn't help because the question I ask is, um, if evidence was presented to the effect that the, the name of the group or the group, you know, is a known group that used to be or is um, a vigilante group, for example, if I, if I am a journalist and I discover a, a camp or a training base or whatever I would call it, being used by invisible forces, Azoka boys, the Hawks, Bamba boys, and so on and so forth. And I film their activities. It could be that they are jogging, they are singing, and so on and so forth. But I established that that is a base they use. Must I, in that documentary, be able to film these people in violent activities before I can call them a vigilante group or a militia group, knowing who Bamba boys uh, are, invisible forces, the hawks, and so on and so forth. So I think that the commission did not give a conclusion that, in my view, um, was, was quite um, logical. The second point is the critical issue about government saying, look, the group exited the castle in October 2018, and multimedia saying, no, they only were evicted after the documentary. Now, the commission uh, on that matter says that, yes, government said that they were, you know, they left the area, uh, the, the castle in October 2018. Multimedia also then presented evidence to show that the government had made efforts to evict them. So one would have then been expecting the commission to conclude that, no, it is true that they left the place in October 2018, or no, it is true that they left only after the documentary was published. But the commission then um, comes in with a statement that one cannot just understand where that comes from in terms of saying, and again, multimedia then links you know, um, the, the documentary with the president. So the question is, what is the link between when they exited and whether or not the documentary had any association um, with the president? And then um, it goes on to talk about ethical issues. But the question is that the three areas that is set out for itself in terms of determining the complaint did not have anything talking about ethical infractions and so on and so forth. That is not to say that if there were issues bordering on ethics, it is not important for the commission to touch on. But that ought to have been stated as one of the issues that it wanted to make a decision on. So I don't think that the decision as we have now um, is quite helpful. I don't think it is straightforward. For, to guide journalists and those of us in the media industry in terms of making decisions on similar issues going forward. Suleiman Abraima is executive director for the Media Foundation for West Africa, raising some pertinent questions about the ruling that was put out by the National Media Commission yesterday. You're still live on the Super Morning Show. Enjoy 99.7 FM. I am Daniel Daze. Welcome in Anklip, a white who brings us food for thought. And food for thought is, one, is brought to you by um, Roverman Productions, Be the Difference, and GCB Bank, your bank for life. Good morning, Anklip. Hi, good morning, um, Chuku Dani, Dani, Dazi. <laughs> and where's my Nigerian name coming from? Ah, but you became a Nigerian today. <laughs> <laughs> because of the Google now. Yes. Process. But it will be nice. It reminds me of... That's what you said during a crazy ride. Mm -hmm. That you were using Google Maps. That's right. And imagine if Google Maps was your mother or something. Was it? Yes. Was a Ghanaian woman? Ghanian, yes. I said ten right. Hey, are you crazy? Ten right? What have you done? <laughs> ah, now I have to reconfigure the whole thing. <laughs> now the next turning is coming. Please don't miss it. Don't miss it like you've done the previous time. <laughs> that would be quite lively. <laughs> So what's for food for thought this morning, Uncle? Well, let me say good morning to Gary. 
Good morning, Uncle Lebo. And how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Great. great. And belated happy birthday. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. It's not belated because it, um, it, it runs till next year. All right. Oh. Oh, oh yeah. Yours yes. is year long, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, I like, it's, I think I'll apply that system. It's 65 myself. now till next year. Oh, yeah, right. I think I'll apply you know, that so system. So there's no belated inside. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> That's fine then. And happy birthday. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, Dan. Um, Last Tuesday, that's July 23, my wife and I celebrated our 36th wedding anniversary. And whilst I confess that the success of our marriage is largely due to the, her patience and love, I have nonetheless, <coughs> I have nonetheless learned a lot about women and marriage in those 36 years. So this morning, in celebration of 36 years of marriage, I share with you some of the lessons I have learned from the institution. Here we go. Lesson number one. It pleases God for a man to love his wife. Then this is a lesson I learned to my great shame two years into our marriage. At that time in my life, I was involved in the quote-unquote work of God, or what we evangelicals call ministry. There's a longer version of the story, but for our purposes this morning, let me give you the abridged version. I had been in Kumasi on business for a week, but I cut my trip short to return to Accra because I had ministry work to do. I rushed home just to put my bag down, and without even sitting down because I was running late, I made for the door. My wife, who had obviously missed me, remember I had been gone for one week, tried to stop me from leaving. I shoved her aside and left. I was not going to let anything or anyone stand in the way of my serving God. I felt very self-righteous and indignant that she was trying to come between me and my God. Then I got into the car and took off, but about 200 meters from the house, God spoke to me clearly. Now stop rolling your eyes because this really happened. The Spirit of God asked, where's your wife? I said, Lord, will you believe that that woman tried to stop me from going, going to serve you? I expected God to be impressed with me, but instead the Lord said, go back to your wife. I said, no, Lord, I can't because I'm running late for the meeting. The Lord said, for whose sake are you going to the meeting? I said, for your sake, Lord. Then the Lord said, if the meeting is really about me, then I am asking you to go back to your wife. Then I did. I did a U-turn and went back home. But from that experience, I realized that a man cannot hide behind his love for God or his service for God to disrespect or neglect his wife. That day, I learned that it pleases God for a man to love his wife, even if it means missing an opportunity to minister. Indeed, I have come to understand that a man's primary field of ministry is his household. Lesson number two. A woman needs her friends. When we married, Florence and I tried to be each other's closest friends. We had been advised not to have friends because friends have often been the doom of a marriage. So she would wait for me to get home to unload on me about her day, and I could not cope with the load. I would come from work tired, and all I wanted was sleep. Meanwhile, she had had some issues in the day she needed to talk about, but I would be too tired to pay attention. And this brought a lot of misunderstanding in our marriage. It was not only just the fact that I was tired, but let's face it, women don't chat as men do. For instance, I get home and my wife asks me, how was your day? And my answer is fine. To a man, that is a very exhaustive and comprehensive answer. But that answer never satisfies any woman. Now let me ask her, how was your day? And she will begin with the traffic situation, the attitude of some of her office colleagues, the rising prices of food staff in the market, how hot the weather is these days, some long-lost friends she ran into in the market, and she may not have come to the real issue she wants to tell me about yet. Now, that is not a woman talking too much. That is a woman answering a question. Women understand this with each other. For us, the men, it is difficult. So... And so even though I make the time to listen to my wife every day, I know that I do not have the stamina to take all she needs to offload. And that is where her friends come in. And the burden on me to listen to her 
reduced. Fortunately for Florence and I, my wife has been blessed with very good, loyal, and godly friends. But then something major happened in the early days of our marriage that emphasized to me the importance of a woman having friends even after marriage. My wife has been very active in Aglo International, formerly known as Women Aglo. She has been the president of, for many years of the Kokomemele chapter and very active at the national level as well. One morning, a very active member of her chapter was hit by a sudden disaster. This woman had arrived with her husband at their shop at Cantomanto when the man complained of headache and left to see his personal doctor. He did not think it was a big deal and, or anything to worry about, and he promised to be back within the hour, and he drove himself to the clinic. Two hours later, when he had not returned, his wife called his line to check on him. A stranger picked the call, introduced herself as a nurse, and asked her to report to, the, to Kolebu. Kolebu, the woman wanted. What would her husband be doing at the Kolebu hospital? Well, she got someone to look after the, hus after the shop and rushed to Kolebu, only to be told that her husband had collapsed and died on arrival at the clinic, and his body had been brought to Kolebu. Can you imagine the effect of that on any woman? To say that she was devastated and dazed would be an understatement. But she had the presence of mind to call my wife and say, Mama Florence, my husband just died. Florence asked her, where are you? She said, at, I am at Kolebu. Stay where you are, said Florence. And then she immediately began calling every agro member she knew who lived near Kolebu. Within 10 minutes, the woman was surrounded by five women. More women arrived later to support and help her. And on to the funeral, which was months later, this woman was never alone. Her friends surrounded her and took over her life until she was able to pick herself up again. You know, men do women great harm when they cut a woman off her friends. A woman's emotional needs are sight that she cannot do without a few friends. I have come to the conclusion that a woman's life is too complicated for a man to fill it completely. And now, lesson number three. Great marriages and terrible marriages have the same problems. The difference is how they are handled. In the days when I was very active in counseling, I noticed that people came to me with issues that they, conv they were convinced were deal breakers. And Florence and I would look at each other and laugh because we would have dealt with the worst situation in our own marriage. I realized that many of the people who turned to Florence and I for help were convinced that we did not have any problems ourselves, that we had been spared some of the problems they were having in their marriages. They were, of course, wrong. We had not been spared. We had only found more productive ways of handling our issues so they did not blow up in our faces. Now, Dan, you know something? On my wedding anniversary, 36th wedding anniversary, I sat down and listed 36 lessons I had learned from life. This is only three of them. Wow. Um, maybe um, next Monday I may continue or I may do something else, but I listed 36 things, one for every year. One lesson for every year. That I'm <laughs> but I'm sure he learns more than one lesson in the, every, every year. Yes, of, but, um, but I listed 36 um, so that one each year will be accounted for. Thank you very much, Uncle Bo. You're welcome. Um, it, it's, it's a very brave decision to share your life the way you do every, every uh, Monday and Thursday morning. And we really appreciate the lessons that we learn. Well, thank you very much. And um, I still haven't forgotten your mischief. <laughs> I had co-conspirators that you can't punish. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed you did. <laughs> uh, so that's it for Food for Thoughts today. I still have a